Rise Imperium for the Super NES, released in 1992, otherwise known as Kido Soko Dion, or Mobile Armor Dion. Before I kick off this diatribe here, my honorable regards and acknowledgments go out to Jenna Marie from Brighton, Jay Doherty, alias MC Facepalm, Chris LeMay, formerly Christy, Luke Sinkowski, aka Luke Ski, Mel Paradise The Office Gamer Girl, Pat Country The NES Punk, Jordan aka Jaclal, Cowl from Dogtoon and Big, Wiley and Kill Collins, Mary Pearl and the Amoroso Siblings, Mike Dunn and his band Blame Shifters, Trembling and Kimolinsky, Brendan and Aaron Hood from Chiptunes Win, and finally Nintendjol, who surprisingly enough beat me to the punch and throwing out his own diatribe for this game. That aside, onto the game's main plotline. It's in the year 2027, literally more than a decade from now, and only a sum of hostile, ultra-high-tech robots and an enslaved League of Cyborgs are but the sole remaining occupants on a distant planet upon which the majority of human life was nowhere in sight, due mostly to their sudden departure a millennium prior, thanks to the immeasurable power of the planetoid space fortress Ektron. The hostile robots and enslaved cyborgs raised on Detch can only be summed up in terms of serving their quote-unquote masters. As it turns out, however, a clandestine military cult consisting of the latter community, whose senses of intellect exceed far beyond even our own no less, have toiled away day in and day out, constructing and manufacturing a highly advanced suit of armor. Gundam, Voltoms, Dunbine, MD Geist, move the hell over! Aboard their mothership Lenoa, this revolutionary armor, hence its title, Imperium aka Dion, whose exclusive purpose is to once and for all obliterate the militant ass master robots and ensure a failsafe triumph for the opposite race, can only be activated and commandeered by a fucking human. Deceptive, yes, but still intriguing nonetheless. No rhyme intended. In terms of gameplay, being much more, if not as much as we'd expect, than just one's average, typical vertical scrolling shmup, featuring a mech this time around, no less. Besides making compiles moosh so much, you're constantly gliding through one civilization after another, demolishing the fuck out of every adversary in your path, while gaining and scoring experience points in order to acquire better and more advanced weaponry and level them up at each numeric interval. Now take note, these two counters indicate how many experience points your mech has accrued, and how many is required for the next level-based benefit. In terms of the overall weaponry, Imperium starts off with a Vulcan gun from the get-go, followed by an energy wave, a voltaic laser beam, and finally a volley of shurikens that can be hurled opposite your desired direction of control, for example left in favor of right, up in favor of down, and so on. Likewise with the diagonals, complete with a limited supply of missile barrages, which are front few between in terms of regaining another throughout each area. Upon leveling up your weapons, their overall attack strength and patterns withstand a dramatic change, and you can even replenish one point of your energy each time. Should you take damage at any point, however, your current weapons are decreased each level, back to fuck off. As far as control setup, which by the way can be adjusted in the option screen beforehand, Y fires any weapon, B swaps any weapons around, X changes up your mech's overall flight speed, and A unleashes its aforementioned missile barrages. Your energy meter is comprised of 5 units, and if you're expecting any chance of refills, if I got a big news flash here, consider yourself shit out of goddamn luck! Upon death, an instant game over is attested, at which point you're left with no other preference but to continue from the title screen, thus resulting in starting from the very beginning of the area in which your ass got totaled, despite retaining the same weaponry from your previous attempt, in which case you'll have to do some serious experience grinding to power your suit back up yet again, which can get rather tedious and extremely harrowing beyond all expectations. Jetting our way to this game's itinerary, you're soaring through the clouds with cityscape portions revealed in between, both in normal PG Keen condition until its sudden disintegration by another dreaded droid armada, a coastal area complete with an underground high tech base in the latter half of said area, a barren, uncharted desert in pursuit of an enemy courier, followed by its interior reaches, a trek on the moon en route to the enemy's base, while their supporting troop ship pops up to send out its reinforcements, a dark vehement asteroid belt in space with the most volatile flotilla you've ever confronted, putting even Belser's forces from Taito's Darius franchise, the Orn Empire from Technosoft's Thunder Force, and even the alien governors from Atomic Robo Kid's absolute motherfucking shame. And finally, a climactic, no turning the hell back encounter of endless adversary onslaught after endless goddamn adversary onslaught, which in turn brings us to their correlating mid and end boss confrontations. That's right, a duo of rotund purple automatons, whose weak point is donkey dick but the red orb, followed by a massive green mech sporting twin cannons, a gargantuan red crab droid sporting bubbles and your typical gunfire, only vulnerable in its briefly visible core, followed by an axe and mace wielding centurion mech, later revamped into a goddamn arachnid that spews out needles while summoning its minuscule offspring, a ninja mech sporting its trademark katana and shurikens, and later cloning itself in three while activating a vacuum core and generating a shit ton of sparks, in which case the real host must be taken the fuck out, a Gotham from A Link to the Past or Gemini Man from Mega Man 3 much? 
A colossal war machine with three differentiating yet synonymous mini-crafts that pop up and land on it one at a time, and their modes of offense depends on the color in which they appear. Red, blue, and yellow, which emits a 360-degree rotating flame stream while firing single ones directly in your suit's general trajectory, attaches the arms of said war machine, thus summoning energy beams from their opposing sockets, and unleashes a fuckload of missiles first above, then below, in the style of Folkmire's Inferno for Battletoads, followed by a detachable white mask, again in the style of Musha and a feminine red-armored mech complete with purple sides, and a twin laser volley emitted through none other than her own tits. Big Viper's long-lost LSD addict, dyslexic bastard step-cousin, whose weak point is its two cores. What do you know? Two greatest references meshed into one, and it's capable of altering its form into, surprise, surprise, another relentless warrior mech brandishing a 360-degree rotating laser whip made up of a row of sparks. A slow-moving behemoth of a bot, with an excessive area of firepower than even the fucking Principality of Xeon from Gundam, Dr. Hell's cronies from Mazinger Z, the Nexrom army from MD Geist, the Ballard Union from Votoms, the Guard Robots, Xtors, and Wasted 13 from the Pat Labor Trilogy, and even the goddamn Neo Sapiens from Exo Squad combined, and finally the great great granddaddy of all Master Mechs, a golden winged sword like Gladiator, brandishing not only a sword, but a raining onslaught of shoulder beams, and though some of them might seem far from intimidating, the sole common foil they share is as follows, in addition to every peril you'll face. They'll all but guarantee your ass gets thrown in the goddamn junk heap in endless unrest, next to the defective piles of Roombas, Game Gear handhelds, and other useless ass gizmos, if your senses and judgments aren't in tip-top form and or shape. That aside, the essential control mechanics are indisputable and far from a hassle to get down pat, especially with the contemporary RPG-inspired experience point system that this game's got going for itself, considering they might result in detestable-ass mishap due to user error. In other words, no matter what the hell happens, it's my own fucking fault, and the gameplay procedure isn't too goddamn banal or tedious to accustom oneself with, that's for sure. In terms of Imperium's challenge, by now, as most of you are already aware, I know hearts from ups when I test them out, and this one is no fucking exception. In spite of the leeway you're given depending on your mech's weapon power and speed levels, most of the aforestated dangers you confront will definitely provide you with a serious case of the red ass in more ways than you think, which is why the former is susceptible to each downgrade upon taking damage, as I established previously, and above all, one of few reasons why I suggest jumping in with the eyes of a hawk, and even the reflexes of the Kozuki family, you know, showing his son's cane and Shane, all meshed into one. Also, bear in mind the limited scarce supply of missiles you're stuck with, which I strongly propose preserving. Shit, even during the boss confrontations, I might add. Cause trust me when I throw this out there, and I shoot you the hell not. This game will slice your eyes out, shove them deep in your scrotum, and simultaneously urinate and ejaculate all over your ocular cavities without even so much as an ounce of remorse while deactivating your landline and mobile services to prevent you from calling a fucking paramedic. For instance, there's those four-way diagonal laser cannons in Stage 2 that pop up both left and right parallel to each other, no less, and in the center is just one, whose attack patterns are about as random as the lottery and speed dating combined, and due to those, the chances of being caught off guard, especially while dealing with the four-way horizontal vertical simultaneous twin gunfire orb turrets, are god knows how many to one. Now remember that continuation feature I pointed out, available in the title screen after recent subjugation? Unlike Capcom's Ghost and Goblins, released six years prior on the NES, which, surprisingly enough, sports the same luxury, and in true Musha and Target Earth fashion, you can only use the this feature no more than four times. Splurge them all, and it's all the way back to square one with your ass. Bottom line, do whatever the hell it takes to boost up your quintuple A game, and above all, refrain from slipping the fuck up at every turn, regardless of how far you're willing to get. For a Super NES game, hailing from the same year as Soho and Compile Space Mega Force, Turtles 4 Turtles in Time, Contra 3 The Alien Wars, The Legend of the Mystical Ninja, Phalanx, Super Star Wars, Rival Turf, Dino City, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, Blazion, The Bio Cyborg Challenge, Axelay, and even the infamous Cool World and Accolades Bubsy Claws Encounters of the Third Kind amongst many. Though the graphics aren't anything spectacular nowadays, they're nothing short of a myriad of spectacles worth witnessing. In addition to the clear-cut sprites, in terms of both your main mech and its supposed assortment of rivals, diminutive and colossal alike, the majority of the top few backgrounds and supporting foreground layers and elements add a hell of a lot to the game's mood-varying incidents, keeping even the most curious gamers, yours truly included, enthralled every fucking second. Some examples include the second wave of artificial adversaries ravaging the cityscape, occurring halfway through Stage 1, the sequels calmly gliding over the coastal area in Stage 2, and even the raging desert sandstorm in Stage 3. And while we're on that subject, lots of stage elements and even those involving your mech's additional weapons have undergone drastic modifications from its original Japanese counterpart, the aforementioned Mobile Armor Dion, namely. For instance, with the exception of the later stages, 1 and 2 contain both an evening cityscape with lights, minus the enemy attack, and that very same coastal area, with extensive red construction beams erected above, respectively, and your suit even gains a homing fire volley instead of the energy wave established here in the US version. The combined efforts of Tokai and Jorudan, this game's developer, surprisingly enough, really knew what the hell they were doing in terms of delivering a top-flight presentation for such an intense yet overlooked rpg slash mup hybrid, in spite of the rare yet randomly alternating slowdown occurrences. 
Music and sound wise, orchestrated by Tenpei Sato, a Valen vs Predator fame developed by the aforementioned Jorudon and released the following year by Activision and IGS. Asmic Sardion, Chico and NMK's Task Force Harrier EX, Telnet and Riot's Exile, Telnet's Valus 2, Hiponichi's Disgaea series, Rhapsody a Musical Adventure, and even Phantom Brave amongst many, alongside Tatsuya Sato and Hiroki Uematsu. The energetic, pulsating, and phenomenal soundtrack isn't half bad, and an absolute marvel to envision, in spite of how great and dull it can become to a few. It's possible and intriguing as the sound effects are, they're an instant meh blah here due to their later repetitive nature, but all in all, far from a complete bore fest. Now, my top 8 songs from this game alone are as follows the opening intro theme, areas 1, 2, 3, and 5, and boss anthems 2, 3, and 4. Concerning Imperium's replayability, need the hell I say any more regarding each and every key gameplay schematic I've established, amongst them including its avant garde experience point system, let alone the extra weaponry and variable difficulty curves this Odyssey supplies. Although it's nowhere near the standards of the earlier referenced Musha, it's one all around extraordinary, out of this galaxy, racing yet bitter aerial, and of course, interstellar expedition, unlike anything the world could possibly visualize. Trust me, it'll make Treasure's Radiant Silver Gun look like Tiger Heli by Tide on Toa Plan. Seriously, why the hell pass it up any goddamn longer? <laughs> Henceforth, my final verdict on Imperium, notwithstanding how this title's been egregiously and arbitrarily eclipsed by other titles from the same era, due to at least a setback or two that I enacted, or that Victor Kai, aka Takai Communications today, never gave a Romulan testicles to at least put out a collection of most of their library, whether they developed the games themselves, or managed to drag in another company to do their dirty ass work. Anyways, mindless tangent shifting aside, it's still a legitimate top flight title not to be missed in the slightest. By all means, I strongly suggest getting my ass the hell out there and sniffing it out, or at the very least, emulating it. And take note of the prices shown here depending on condition, whether loose or complete. And as always, I assure you, there won't be so much as a solitary iota of lament doing so. Until then, many thanks for watching, listening, tuning in, and be on the lookout for Season 4 which will take effect on or after Valentine's Day. That being said, this is the Hardcore Retro God proudly signing off, indefinitely.